sermon. <clears throat> Last week in Colossians 3, starting in verse 18 and ending in Colossians 4, chapter 1, we were looking at how Paul, as a Christian, was describing three types of relationships that other people also described in his time, in his era, in his day and age. And those three types of relationships was wives to husbands, children to parents, and slaves to masters. An introductory comment before we get into the sermon text for today. The sermon today is entitled, Dear, and then it's just a, a, a blank. So if you have your sermon handout, it just says, Dear blank. How many of you ever heard before of people saying that the Bible is God's love letter to you? Perhaps some of you have heard that before, and I think it's a, it's a well-intentioned, it's a well-meaning phrase, the Bible is God's love letter to you, but it can easily be misconstrued and actually cause problems for us when we interpret the Bible. Because when you read the Bible, you say, you know, this is Paul to the church at Colossae. It's not dear Nick love God, the Bible, God's love letter to Nick. It's dear church at Colossae, or it's dear church at Galatia, or dear church at Corinth. And so if the Bible is God's love letter, it's the Bible is God's letter first to the people back then. Most likely, Paul penned this in his first imprisonment in Rome. He, he uh, put a lot of letters together in Rome. Uh, if I can off the top of my head try to remember them. Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, uh, 60 to 62 AD. And so that's written for dear people of the first century. Okay, so for, for us to say that this is um, also not just to them, but it's also for us, we have to figure out, well, what's different in our world today in the 21st century from the first century and take the there and then and apply it to the here and now. Actually going to, the last bit of introduction is talk about different world views, different ways in which people thought about life and reality. Stories that they told themselves about how the world operated. The red will be how people thought about the world perhaps in the 15th century BC. Um, it's thought by some people uh, who hold to uh, the idea that Moses perhaps penned all of or most of the first five books of the Bible, if you have a, depending upon if you take an early date or a late date of Exodus, the 15th or 12th century BC. And so if we describe Mosaic authorship for sake of simplicity to Genesis 1 and 2, um, we see that Moses is talking about people many, many hundreds of years before Jesus. And he's talking about people in their view, in their understanding of how they understood the world to be created. What do I mean by that? I mean by that is this. Hundreds of years before Jesus, this was the pre-modern, pre-scientific world. Right? You don't hear terms like the modern world until the 16th century or the Enlightenment until the 17th century, also called the Age of Reason. You don't have the scientific method. You don't have people talking about things in the test tube, observable or repeatable, or you can demonstrate it, or something that can be verified or falsified. These types of things, which were 17th century and onward, they weren't there 1,500 years before Jesus lived. So Jesus is talking about people who thought about the world in terms of red ways, pre-modern world. And all these people had creation stories back then. The Egyptians had their creation stories. 
the Akkadians, the Sumerians, the Hittites, the Canaanites, all these different people have their creation stories. And they're coming at it with red Lego bricks, meaning a pre-modern, pre-scientific view of the world. We live today post-enlightenment. We see the world in a different way. When we ask questions about creation, we're asking yellow type questions, post-enlightenment type questions. So when we read Genesis 1 and 2, we don't want to read it with yellow type framework questions. We want to read it with red Lego brick type questions and say, well, what would the Hebrews have thought? What would the Israelites have thought? And more or less, there's going to be similarities and dissimilarities, but they're going to be reading that in the framework of the Egyptians, the Canaanites, the Sumerians, all these other people groups is how they're going to read, understand Genesis. What is their creation story going to want to address? When we think about creation today, we think about things popping into physical existence, things that you can be putting in the test tube. When does th- something come into creation? Is when does something materially exist? That's how we think about things today. Back then, hundreds of years before Jesus, they were thinking about creation saying, what's the relationship between a God and a human? Tell me about the formation of order. Tell me about the formation of civilization and community. Relationship with God and man can't be put in a test tube. Relationships about community and civilization don't fit into a test tube. Tying it together to where we're at now. If I'm to understand Genesis 1 and 2, I need to read it against the backdrop of red legal bricks. So when I read how the Christians are approaching creation, I need to understand how the Egyptians were approaching creation and the Canaanites were approaching creation, Assyrians, Sumerians, so forth. Once I understand, I can situate the text in its context and I have a better chance of interpreting it for than here and now. So I read Genesis in light of what's happening around the culture back then for the passage in Colossians, to make the parallel now, we read the relationships of wives to husbands, children to parents, slaves to masters. We also read them in light of what are they saying about those th- same things back then. Last week, it wasn't what the Egyptians or the Canaanites or the Hittites were saying. We're not talking about Genesis. The last week we were talking about, well, what does Plato say? What does Aristotle say? What does Xenophon say? What does Seneca say about household codes? So we need to understand the text in context because at the end of the day, it's not dear Nick, love God, it's dear Church of Colossae or dear ancient Near Eastern world if we're dealing with Genesis, love God. Those Bible's words, unfortunately, are frozen in time. As much as what I don't want the Bible to often be, sometimes it's situational ethics. And we have to figure about how do I bridge the gap from the there and then to the here and now so the Bible still speaks for us today. Last week I ended the sermon with this idea of the power that Paul is introducing into the slave code or into the station codes. We see in these three sorts of relationships the husbands holding a certain amount of power, the parents holding a certain amount of power, and the slave owner holding a certain amount of power. And Paul's point, which is new in a lot of ways to the world back then, 
dear church of Colossae knew, is that he has this phrase, as, as is fitting with the Lord. And he ends it with this idea of, you may think you have power, but think about the God who ultimately holds the power. God is referenced seven times between Colossians 3.18 and Colossians 4.1. We're going to continue the idea of thinking through the world back then and the world now in the sermon today. You please pick up the story with me in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3, starting in verse 22. And continuing on to Colossians 4. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it, not only when their eye is on you and to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and with reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord and not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for his wrong, and there is no favoritism. Now catch this here. For one, masters provide your slaves with what is right and fair because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Okay? So, if you have power, don't abuse, don't mistreat other people with your power. Rather, use your power responsibly and realize, ultimately, you're answerable to God, who holds ultimate power. Continuing on in verse 2. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains, which is referencing this idea that Paul wrote this in imprisonment. Verse 4, pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Tychicus will tell you all of the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances, and he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here my fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the, cous the cousin of Barnabas. You have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends his greetings. These are the only Jews among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God. And they proved a comfort to me. Epaphras who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends his greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha, and the church in her house. Verse 16. After this letter has been read to you, see that it also is read to the church of the Laodiceans, and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the work you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Several names, none of which are common in today's world, mostly, right? Except for Mark. Um, you hear of Aristarchus, you hear of Archippus, you hear of these different folks. You hear of a guy named Onesimus, 
You may have caught that there among the list of names there in Colossians 4. It tells of this man named Onesimus. Onesimus seems to have been a runaway slave which could have possibly stolen also from his master. His master was this man named Philemon. Philemon was the slave owner of Onesimus. These guys were from Colossae. That's why they get addressed here to the letter to the, Coloss- uh, to the Colossians. Yes, Colossians. Let's try to think through Paul, in a certain way, addresses slavery there in Colossians 3, 22 through 4, 1. Saying, slaves obey your masters, but masters treat them right and in a fair way because you also will have to give an account to God. Picture this. You're Onesimus. Stole from your master, you're running away. You're not a Christian at this time, but you eventually meet up with Paul. You become converted. You're a Christian. Paul, understanding Roman law of that day, and Onesimus, understanding Roman law of that day, understood Philemon, that slave owner, what Onesimus had done, what is punishable, by death. Paul writes a letter on behalf of the slave Onesimus to the slave owner Philemon, living in Colossae. He gives different instructions to the individual Philemon than he would others Dear church at Colossae, or dear such and such as you try to live as a Christian in a non-Christian world. So he writes a letter to Philemon. Dear Philemon, this is what I want you to do in respect to Greco-Roman slavery. I have Onesimus with me here who ran away from you. And I appeal to you not as a command of Christ, this is Philemon chapter 1, verse 8, I'm recapping it for you now, not as a command in Christ, but I appeal to you, Philemon, out of love, that you should receive Onesimus back, not to continue as your slave, now I'm recapping verse 16-ish, receive him back not as your slave, but rather as a brother. Notice, once again, how we need to be carefully applying the situations to get us to the here and now. Paul writes to the the Colossians, Dear Church at Colossae, this is how I want you to approach these social structures, wives to husbands, children to parents, slaves to masters, Dear Church at Colossae. Later on, Dear Philemon, who's a slave owner. This is what I want you to do in respect to Onesimus, your slave. No longer as your slave, now as your brother. That's first century. This was May 26, 2014. May 26, 2014, Time Magazine. The title of the article, Bring Back All Girls. What the 276 girls abducted, abducted from a Niger- Nigerian school tell us about human trafficking. You remember, you may remember this. It starts off, at first the students thought the men who arrived that night had come to save them. 
human trafficking, this form of modern day slavery, 21st century slavery, not 16th to 19th century transatlantic slave trade based upon race, not first century Greco-Roman slavery. This is dear people of the 21st century. If God were penning this today. Quoting from the article, The Modern Slave Trade. It may not look like the slave trade of old. No country legally protects the institution of slavery anymore. And the shackles are economic or psychological rather than physical. But the trade in humans is a thriving 21st century business. Finding people to enslave is not that complicated. The most, most fertile ground shares three main attributes. One, a heavy mantle on poverty. Two, a cluster of the especially vulnerable people. And th third, only a trace amounts of the rule of law. Much of the world fits that description. The most conservative abolitionists estimate that 21 million people are currently in some sort of involuntary servitude, while others say it's close to 30 million people, all of which are made in the image of God. Article goes on. The sex trafficking industry is hugely profitable. The annual profit margin on each woman is about 70%. Highly successful companies such as Google have a profit margin of around 22%. Because it's so luc lucrative, traffickers have found a myriad of ways to conscript new women. Sometimes victims are kidnapped, and sometimes they're simply hoodwinked by false offers of a better life through training, education, or a low-level but legal job in a wealthy, far away land. Some girls are wooed by boyfriends who turn out to be captors. What they thought was a ticket to paradise it takes them instead to hell on earth. Tragically, some of these girls, the 21 million to the 30 million, some of these girls are sold by their parents usually unwittingly. Research finds that traffickers in Southern Asia are paid $300 to $800 per person. In Mumbai, India, each sexual service a girl renders could earn her exploiters $10. It's a difficult thing to take the kind of slavery in the first century that Paul is talking about. How do you live as a Christian in this larger structure in Colossians 3 and the first part of Colossians 4 than to apply it to a particular person who is a Christian then in the book of Philemon and then to apply it to the 21st century um, dear Whiting Community Baptist Church. My hope is that we will be a voice for the voiceless and for those of us who have power, who have education, who are blessed with a thinking mind, who are blessed in a career path or a career direct trajectory that can do something about these things, we would see our names in that address line, dear our name. Once again, for those of you who could not join us last Sunday, I pray that you will look at last Sunday's sermon and help bring this full circle. It was brought up, and rightfully so, in Christian Education and Fellowship last Sunday. So Paul is saying to the church at Colossae, you as a Christian, um, how are you going to live when you wake up tomorrow? How are you going to live when you wake up tomorrow, given the system that you have? And Paul doesn't address the question to the church at Colossae, okay, this is how I'm going to live up to, wake up tomorrow, but what do we ever do about this in terms of the social structure or the public policy? How do we do this 
with this at the other levels outside of my individual self. Not addressed in Colossians 3, but the question is raised and relevant. Will we see ourselves, some of us who have been blessed with education, with wealth, with whatever means and resources you have, will you allow God to say, not Church of Colossae, not dear Philemon, but dear Nick, dear Dave, dear Mike, dear Fritz, dear Kathy, dear George, and use what you've been given in the 21st century, most blessed country perhaps ever to exist and to be a voice, not only for people in our neighborhoods, but for the millions of people that don't have a voice around the world. Let us pray. Father, our world does not look like the world when the book of Genesis was written. Father, our world does not look like the world when Colossians was written. We live in a post-enlightenment world. Lord, we live still in a world of sin. Father, that world of sin still exists. It looks different, but it's nonetheless just as equally as painful and broken and fallen. Father, we ask that you would help us to recognize the gifts that we have in the time that we live in, in the place that we live in, that we would see the responsibility we have that we would not distance ourselves from the husbands, from the parents, from the masters of Colossians 3, but we would see ourselves in a our privileged position in the 21st century. That those people in Colossians 3 had power, that we here today have educational power, literacy power, financial power, people that have amazing power, people that have a voice. And Father, because you've given us the Holy Spirit, we have the ultimate power, the power of Christ in us, the Spirit indwelling every believer. Lord, we pray that you would give us wisdom and discernment, use our privileged position for kingdom purposes, both as individuals and as community, that we would bring community to look more like the garden in a pre-fallen world, the garden of Genesis 1, 2, and 3, the garden of when things were redeemed and reconciled and people could walk with you and not be shamed. So, Father, speak to us. Comfort us. Also challenge us. Help us to use a power for kingdom purposes. Jesus' name, amen.